Free Select Board on Monday, the 6th of May. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the agenda. Okay. Um, I will move to approve the agenda with a few changes for those keeping track at home. Uh, item B on the consent agenda for Jim's Pizza, we are adding that that also includes outside consumption permit for the deck. For item H, the parentheses should be Vermont Beer Collective. Um, item J is being taken off of the consent agenda and moved to after the bylaw update public hearing. Prior to the bylaw update public hearing, we're reviewing a resolution of sympathy um, for Steve Lott's speech as a new agenda item. And the 825 item, um, for the entertainment permit, uh, I would replace that with a buyout request for 38 Union Street. So I move to approve the agenda with those stated changes. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Mike. I do. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, do we have a, a sign up for everybody? I think I have everyone written down. I got Lisa on her way in the door, this gentleman with the black hat. I don't know your name. Yeah, this is Liam, Liam Mahabir, M-A-H-A-B-I-R. Okay, I know that name from tax rules. So. Mm -hmm. And um, I think everybody else I knew, I'm going home now. <laughs> <laughs> Not so fast. <laughs> Not a chance, huh? No, I think okay. you're good, thanks. All right, next on the agenda, agenda is the uh, consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any, uh, uh, any opposed? Aye. Uh, I heard the ayes. Any opposed? Do I have a chance to uh, address us in, during public session? No opposed. Uh, any abstentions? Okay, uh, it's approved as uh, as amended. Now we have the public session. Chris, uh, I was interested in asking if we could pull uh, letter C off the consent agenda item, or at least have a brief discussion about what that permit entails, uh, as I'm directly impacted by what goes on there. Um, have had some concerns in the past and just want to be reassured that this isn't going to be an open door to something that's has been violated in the past and uh, you know I've been trying to be good with my neighbors there and uh, reach out to them quite frequently to ask them to close their doors and windows mm -hmm. uh, you know it's one thing for people to go there on a once a week or once every two week basis to listen to music and hang out and have a good time and whatever but we're subject to it every every night that they're open um, and it just becomes a little bit much after a while so I don't know exactly what the permit uh, specifics are um, okay um, can you um... well is there a liquor license and they're outside consumption permits, so it doesn't really have anything to do with their music, Chris. It's strictly their ability to serve alcoholic beverages. So none of the other issues. Not in this item. Changes from that perspective. This this is this is strictly for their yearly renewal of their first, third, and outside consumption. Okay. So it doesn't really speak to their entertainment all right. at all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Anything else on the public agenda or anyone, anything not on the warned agenda that people would like to address? Sir, come on forward, please. Yeah. Mine's to your town manager. I've been trying to get a hold of him. Uh, you. You've, uh, have a seat and please introduce to yourself. Out. I've been trying to get a hold uh, of I'm him. I'm sorry, could you please Jeff introduce Poitras. yourself? Hmm? Jeff Poitras. Okay. I've been trying to get a hold of him for three years. He won't call us back, won't call our lawyer back. He won't pay our bills for the Ducks for Moore Town Fire District. And that's why I'm here. I want to know why nothing's being done. 
I can address that. Okay. Uh, so first off, my cell phone is on the website. I have had no calls from you. And I can share that record because the town How many for times it. have I been here? To see me, never. And talk to Woody. Yes, I have. You're never here. Uh, You're so out of your uh, Jeff, if you could just please address me. You're not talking directly to him. You're addressing the select board. Secondly, I haven't been here for years. Okay. Uh, in fact, I haven't been here two years. Close enough. Uh -huh. um, if this is something uh, like this. Hang on, finally. Oh, his attorney was Elijah Emerson, who worked for the Duxbury Moortown Fire Protection District. There are no ascending bills. Yeah, there is. Well, not according to your counsel. Well, I talked to him today. There's still an out, yeah, $600 outstanding bill. Well, he knows to send that to me. He's been called a number he of times. He has sent that. it to you. We got nothing in the mail from him. I'm sure attorneys aren't shy about collecting their bills. It's just been my experience. So I beg to differ. He can call me anytime he knows how to reach me. I, in fact, have called him to make sure that there are no outstanding bills. How many times have you called me? I don't think I've called you since the district was dissolved because we have no business it, you, you were supposed to call me before the district got dissolved because we were supposed to go to the meetings at the state house, which we were never invited. You took everything upon yourself. You took the check from us, and we never heard another word from you. The district voted to dissolve and to merge with EFUD. EFUD took it from there. We were the supposed to go to the, by the, state the legislature. legislature. And the legislature gave me about a day's notification before those meetings. They slipped it in at the last minute, which was a good thing, which is what you wanted. At that point, the district did not have a functioning board. Yeah, they did. So plain and simple, the dissolution of the district was accomplished. It was accomplished as planned. It was accomplished in the year that we hoped it got done. Show it to me. I, we've received nothing from this office for anything that was done. If what you're saying, I want to see it in writing. So it's, and I'll be here Friday to get there, it. You can come Wednesday to an EFA meeting. There was a bill adopted by the I'll state. I'll be here Friday. You should be able to have together. it all by Friday. And get it on the, on the website now. It's on the state's website. No, I'm right. a, I'm gonna, I'll be down here Friday. You can be here all you want. I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to be I know, because you, you, you haven't been here. So both of you, this is yeah. public comment. I think yeah. we've heard your comment. I would just note for the record, I think it sounds like it pertains to the Edward Farrar Utility District. This board does not have jurisdiction. That is a separate no, elected board in this town. No, the one did it all, not the fire district. Again, you can have made your statement. Thank you for your statement. I think we're going to proceed with our agenda. <laughs> Told you. And lawyers did the same thing. You guys are a joke. All right, we're off to a good start. <laughs> Anyone else have a public comment? Hearing none, we'll move forward uh, with the bylaw update and uh, public hearing. Do we need to uh, make a special note of the public hearing? Also, no, I had resolution of sympathy, but we can do it after. Who's going to present this? The which which part? Uh, the uh, update on the um, bylaws. I can give a brief intro. Okay. Um, so there's there's two public hearings um, required as part of the bylaws, but the day the planning commission voted to advance the bylaws to you, they are in fact in effect. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're in essence um, operating something that technically the law. Um, if, if the select board decides to make amendments to the bylaw, and depending on the um, nature of the amendments, um, we could in fact have to restart part of the public hearing process. Minor technical amendments I think are, are can be considered minor and, and the process can continue as is, but at some point in essence there's a, there's a kickback, excuse me, to the planning commission. Um, the public process for the bylaw rewrite um, started uh, months and months ago um, over the winter. The actual process and work by the Planning Commission, I believe, started eight years ago. Um, I wasn't here three years ago. I also wasn't here eight years ago. <laughs> and I think, um, I think they were well served by staff. I think they were well served by the public input. Um, I think they took the public input into account. 
from from my perspective as as the new ish manager uh, something I've heard from the Planning Commission, from the Development Review Board, from staff, I think from the Select Board, is the desire for density in our downtown. And these bylaws um, enable that to happen in a, in a big way. And so from, from the perspective of addressing the housing shortage, this is a major tool in the toolbox um, that I think is a big win for the town. Um, I think that the PC is, is well positioned to comment if they want to add to that. I wanted to give a brief overview, but I think they've done, um, they've done a masterful job in pulling this all together. I know they've worked weekly now for about the past six months. Um, staff have been with them weekly for about the past six months. It's been a, it's been a marathon with a sprint at the finish here um, to get to the finish line, but I think it's, I think it's good work. Um, how's that for a a quick overview without getting into the technicalities, which are well explained on the website. Yeah, we're here really to answer questions if you have. Can I add Roger? Yeah, go for it. Roger, can I just quickly? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, just by way of, because I know at previous meetings there's been conversations, I just want to name anyone who would like to follow along in real time on, uh, in the room. There's a couple printed copies in the front of the room. Anyone who navigates online to www.waterbraevt.com, um, there's a nice little banner at the top that says, Notice of Select Board Public Hearing Zoning Bylaws. You can click that. They're then on that next landing page will be at the bottom in blue text, bylaws final draft select board public hearing. Uh, it's a 49 page document. If you scroll to that last page, uh, it says zoning district map updated March 12th, 2024. I say that just to make sure we're all looking at the same versions. Um, and would also just flag that below that is the relevant maps, reference map, for this rewrite, which notably is not for the entire geographic area of Waterbury, but for a subset. Again, you can visualize that subset in the map, um, but as was alluded to, it's for the area in Waterbury between the Winooski River and Interstate 89. Um, and before we kick off public comment, I would just like to publicly thank and acknowledge Planning Commission members, both current and past, who put the work into doing this over many years, as well as, again, town staff current and past who helped support it. Um, and again, some of both who are here today. So thank you. And then again, the goal is for us to receive feedback on this draft as prepared by the Planning Commission. Again, just noting they've had two, actually three of their own hearings prior to us as the select board receiving it. And uh, just a point of order, Tom. Uh, this is the first of two hearings of the select board. So we won't be making any vote on this tonight. Uh, we'll have a following hearing uh, next meeting. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Come on, please. Stand here because when somebody's back there, I can't yeah. right. sure. hear. Sure. Suit yourself. Okay. Whatever. Thank you. uh, My name is Kathy Grace, and I live on South Main Street. And um, us and Bachelor Street are being redesignated as a mixed-use district. I've been to zoning meetings for as long as they've been working on these. Um, it's five or six years. I've been to all of the input meetings and um, the um, roundabout had put in there that the goals were for um, to create options for housing of all kinds, not just for um, multi-family units. And I attended all the meetings. It was a recent one. I think it was like in March I learned that multi-use districts, if any of you were in them, if you currently have a single family home, you will not ever be able to sell it as a single family home. It can only be sold as a multi-family unit. I believe I'm correct on that. I guess the I call it, wait, you just said if you're in a single family home, you can't sell it as a single right. family home. Yes, I, you can. Unless you go through um, DRB, am I correct? That's what the zoning wants to know. No, no, no. You're this is what it says. It's a misinterpretation. Yeah. Okay. Well, but you, you, you're directing your comments. Yeah, well, uh, well, then you can clarify the matter, but what I was told mm -hmm. when I checked with the zoning administrator and everyone is that I can keep my single family home as long as I live in it. Talk to them. But if I sell it, it can only be sold to someone as a multi unit dwelling. Also, just a minute, also, we have two two duplexes down there, and I was told that those could not be returned to a single family unit. Is that correct? Is that correct? Okay. 
So my point is, everywhere else in the village, you're allowing four and five units, multiple units, but you're not putting the same onus on them about not returning a duplex to a single family home or allowing us, if I'm misinterpreted, I'm sorry, but it looked like I had to go to the DRB to be, get permission to keep my house a family unit. So I have 37 signatures from people down on South Main Street and Bachelor Street um, because we also have the flood problem down there. So the density issues are, are really um, a problem for us. So I'd like to be able to I'll read the petition thing, but I'd like to give you some other background. Okay. Uh, we, the residents of South Main Street and Bachelor Street in Waterbury, Vermont, have lived in our neighborhoods for generations. Our streets are lined with historical single unit homes that have housed our families and seen them grow. These homes are not just buildings, they're a testament to our shared history and community spirit in the village. However, proposed zoning law threatens to disrupt this harmony. The law seeks to prohibit the continued use of single family homes in a mixed-use neighborhood once they are sold. It also seeks to prevent owners or future buyers from reverting their, home, their multiple unit homes to a single housing <coughs> unit if they so choose. <coughs> this proposed regulation is detrimental to future families who may not fit into some smaller quarters and takes home equity decisions making out of the hands of the property owners and into the select board and planning commission. Additionally, the areas of South Main Street and Bachelor Street are located in a floodplain which has been ravaged over the past decade through water displacement. The creation of more and larger buildings in this area threatens our safety and create more water shifting and movement onto our homes, even with the best of flood mitigation practices. The Planning Commission cites Act 47, a housing bill that eases rules for some new construction and the home shortage, as the need for these changes. However, this law does not remove single family housing as an option but rather declares that multifamily housing should be allowed in areas where they were once prohibited. It's not asking to eliminate single family homes, it's asking to allow more than two units, which is all that used to be, you used to be able to do in our district. However, the, um, according to data from the U.S. Census Bureau in 2019, 61% of housing units in Vermont were single unit structures. Current high interest rates and housing costs have put downward pressure on new single family construction anywhere, including the village. This has made single family rentals a more efficient option, efficient option for families when they can find them. About one third of renters currently live in single family units. However, the current percentage of available single family rental housing in Vermont is now just 24.6% and I quote the sources for that. Most of the current existing apartments and those being constructed in the village are typically just one or two bedrooms. This is not suitable for family of, a, of four or more. According to the State of Vermont's Children, published by Governor Scott in 2022, 19.8% of Vermont children under 12 are experiencing the divorce of a parent or guardian. When this occurs, two housing units are now needed for, to accommodate these families versus just one. This is a rarely talked about income on the housing, uh, impact on the housing crisis in Vermont, and another reason why single family homes should continue to be an option throughout an entire town where there's generally enough green space for children to safely play. We believe the proposed zoning changes do not consider the needs or preferences of all local residents, since single family housing is permitted in other areas of town in the village, but not in the mixed use districts once they're sold. What makes our area of town so different from the others when the number of residential homes on our streets are essentially the same. The space, work, um, excuse me, the proposed regulation also ignores the fact that many families prefer living in single family homes for various reasons, such as privacy space, working from home, and freedom to customize their living spaces in according with their family needs. If they choose to add an auxiliary dwelling or create a duplex that they need to manage themselves, it should be the homeowner's choice and not that of the planning commission or the select board. Additionally, family who's lived on South Main Street and Bachelor Street for generations have made plans to pass down or sell their historical single family homes to their heirs who have growing families of their own. These own this zoning regulation will make that process much more difficult without going through the expense and lengthy process of applying for conditional use permit. My son currently works for the State Department. He works overseas. He's equivalent of a um, major general. And he will be returning. And we have a duplex that we would like him to live in. 
but he won't be able to. We won't, he won't be able to change that to a single family home for his three growing daughters and his family under these zoning ordinances, even though we've owned that home for nearly 40 years. Um, additionally, um, excuse me, we urge the select board to not adopt the proposed zoning regulation changes that relates to single family dwellings in the mixed use zone. This change could displace many generational families from their cherished homes, reduce the number of affordable single family rental or purchase options in our town, and remove the decision making from the homeowners. <coughs> so we, the undersigned, believe that every family should have the right to choose where they live based on their needs rather than on restrictive zoning laws. We urge you to reject any bylaw language that does the following. Disallow single family dwellings in the mixed use flood zone areas at South Main Street and Bachelor Street as permitted uses, and, or disallows the creation of a single family home <coughs> in existing multi-use dwelling. All right, thank you, Kathy. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to point out people. Um, no, you're fine. So, so on the screen, um, is a section of bylaws related mixed use zoning districts, which I believe you referred to, ma'am. So item three discusses single family dwellings. So where does this say single family? Item three. Three. Sure. So so the first sentence says, mm -hmm. in short, you can continue the use of a single family home in the district, provided it was used as a single family home at the time the bylaws were established. So in, in layperson's terms, if it's a single family home now, it can remain as such. Mm -hmm. So that first point you made, I think, was not correct. I think you said the opposite. I said, uh -huh. unless we go to sell it. That, I added that. It can be, I, I can keep continue to live in a single family home, but if I choose to sell it, it cannot be sold as a single family home. No. No, I believe that's incorrect. Well, read it because I, I, I went to the zoning and they so. told me, and it says what you have to do is go to the DRB and get a condi conditional use permit so, to keep it a single family home. Let me simply read it out loud. Nothing in these bylaws shall prohibit the continued use of a single family dwelling in the mixed use zoning district, provided that the structure was used as a single family dwelling at the time the bylaws were established. Right. So that's. Period. To me, clear language, nothing shall prohibit the continued use of a single family home. So you, that can be a single family home today and you can sell it and it can remain a single family home. The second part of this sentence, I believe you had factually correct and that says a single family dwelling may not use, may not replace multiple uses within a structure on the adoption date is by law. So what that means is, in my understanding, you cannot um, take a multi-family dwelling and convert it to a single-family dwelling in that district. And then the third part says a single-family dwelling use may be extended, simply meaning, again, in my layperson's terms, you can you can add an addition onto your single-family dwelling. So that, that was not misinterpreted. That was not explained to me by Mr. Bishop he, when I went to see him, nor was it explained to me when I spoke to a different planning commission member. Okay. So that's A, and B, it still doesn't address the problem that I said about the sun. I won't be able to turn our duplex into a single family home for him. And I don't believe right. that should be your choice. It's not, you're not doing that in the other districts. Why, to me, if you're creating housing everywhere, why isn't it the same in the other districts? Why, why mixed use? Why is that different? There's not even a single, single commercial building on Bachelor Street. There's not any. In the area for I think we've got a clarification from the okay. uh, planning Just, commission. Yeah. There is, this is applicable also in the downtown. District. It's also, yeah. There's no single family housing in, in the downtown. Downtown and mixed use share the same. Residential, I mean, you have residential neighborhood, the others can still neighborhood change outside of the mixed Correct. use in downtown. Right. And I guess we're trying to say we're a neighborhood. <laughs> you know, we are. We've been for years. Mm -hmm. And one other point, I yeah. believe that property values in the village, single family homes bring more money than multifamily homes. Mm -hmm. And when you create a single family home and you try to make it into a multifamily home, somebody's going to have to invest a lot of money in retrofitting it, et cetera, and that's going to raise the rents. It's going to do the opposite of what you want because people are going to have to put more money into it to make it a multi-use. 
And we're going to have so many apartments that are one and two bedroom, the value, yeah, rents will be maybe a little cheaper, but will people mm -hmm. even be able to rent them? <laughs> right. Sure. All right. Other comments? Yes, ma'am. Come on up. I'm Diane Villadu. I live at 66 North Main Street. And I have um, questions about my property, too. We purchased this 45 years ago. We raised our children in that home. They love the home. They hope someday to inherit it and the land with it. Um, we have two lots in our backyard, basically. Um, we bought this at a foreclosure and um, cleaned it all up. It's wide open, our house sits on the street, and we have a half acre along the back of our land. Our plan was to divide that up into it so that my daughter could build a house there. She's 33 years old, she's saving her money, she's living in Barrie, and she's hoping to someday be able to move back to Waterbury. And when we bought this, we worked hard, we did not make a lot of money. Our, our investment, our home is our money. That's where our values are. And I'm not sure now that my daughter, that we can sell a, a section of our backyard to her so that she could build a single family home in that. It doesn't seem clear to me. Maybe under conditional use um, paragraph, that might apply. But I just, I'm just wondering, should I get a lawyer and find out if that can happen? Or what's the story? I'm devastated that maybe the value of our property is not there anymore. It's just, I don't know what else to say about it. It really, it makes you really sad because, uh, like I said, that's our life work, our life investment. My husband worked at the state hospital. I worked for a church. You think we made a lot of money? No. But our house is worth a lot of money our house and our land. So I'm looking to find out whether or not my daughter can build a single family home. I'm not interested in putting multi buildings in the backyard. I don't want to become a landlord for everybody else. I just want to be able to, put, to give my daughters some land for her to put a house on it. And can that happen? Mm -hmm. Any clarification? Uh, I believe you're in the downtown district. 66 North Main Street. Yeah, so it's currently written that we're in the downtown district. No, I'm not. I'm in the mixed use. Mixed so, use. 66 North Main. Okay. She's a so person. then no. No, I can't sell. When you, when you subdivide a lot under the current regulation, when you subdivide that lot, then a single family dwelling would be a non-conforming use. It's a not, it's a, not a permitted use. Okay. So you'd have to put up like a duplex or something like that. Or an ADU. Or an ADU, a house of ADU. A house with ADU. And I understand that that's distressing to you. And I think that it's important to understand why this regulation, why this regulation is being considered. Because we have a lot of people who don't have access to housing in our downtown area. Our downtown area, especially those areas of water and sewer, which primarily this phase one area is, is targeted for increased density. So. When we're looking at a lot of the changes that we made over the course of the past two years, really, we reduced lot sizes, we reduced a lot of setbacks, we increased denser housing in a lot of different areas to provide more access. We understand that that's going to impact people. But a big part of why this essentially prohibition on single family dwellings in mixed use and downtown is occurring is because once we set that pattern of single-family dwellings, we don't really get a chance to change that for a very long time. And so it is our hope with these regulations that we can set a different pattern for certain parts of the town. That's the hope. So we're not going to be, I think, we're not going to be right in all cases. It's not going to, one size is not going to fail. We understand that. But this is what we're trying to do essentially for the greater good of the community to encourage more people to be able to live here to access it. So I understand that in your specific case, that's not exactly desirable. However, I think that that, it's important to understand that that's where the planning commission is coming from. There are exceptions to everything. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There are very few lots in Waterbury that have the open space that we have. I, I, I'd be very curious to know how many other people have that much land behind their house. I should have done it years ago, but I wasn't sure that she would want that to move in. Mm -hmm. And then you, then you couldn't have done anything about it. She would own that, that lot. But, to me, it feels like we're taking care of other, other people, but we can't even take care of our own families who grew up here and lived here. It, it just doesn't seem fair. And I know one person on the select board who turned a multi-unit build, or a duplex they think into a single family home, because that best fit his or her needs. And it seems like that should be a personal choice. You didn't pay our mortgage. You didn't go through the flats. You know, neither did the people you want to live here. I get, you know, but I can't help but think that going up and allowing bigger buildings, you know, other places that aren't in floodplains for um, more single and, you know, one and two bedroom units, but I don't think taking it away from certain parts of the village while allowing it in other parts of the village is the way to go. Our home isn't any less valuable mm -hmm. than it is to somebody, uh, is Union Street mixed or neighborhood? Neighborhood. Neighborhood. Randall Street. Randall Street, yeah. I mean, what makes your houses more valuable to, for you to make decisions about than us? Is Randall Street going to be allowed to turn a duplex into a single family home? Yes. Yeah. Is Union yeah. Street going to be allowed to turn a duplex into a single family home? Yeah. So, so why can't we? I live on the other side of the tracks. Maybe okay. I can. Georgiana. I'm Georgiana Birmingham. I live on uh, Batchelder Street and uh, public speaking is tough. I always sound like I'm going to cry. I'm, I'm, I'm not sad. Um, uh, yeah, I just um, was talking with folks about the single family restrictions and um, in addition to taking away homeowners' rights, which seems unjust. I think that the, the zoning board has gone through a lot of work to make some really good plans to increase affordable housing, and, and most everybody wants that, I think. I think what we don't want to do is create like segregation, like here's where the renters get to live and here's where the people who own their homes get to live. And if you didn't already own your home, then you're not going to be able to or you're going to have a multi, you, you have less choice. So you're like in or you're out. And I think the idea between of building affordable housing in town makes us a, a diverse community where we can take care of each other. And I think that's what we want to work toward. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Um, so, on that Can last. Introduce yourself. Oh, Dave Rogers. Live in the village. I've also been on the DRB almost 20 years now. Um, just wondering about the last comments that were just made. Um, so it doesn't seem right to have that different for some streets than others. People should be able to choose, or at least have the option to come to the DRB to get that permitted to go back to a single family dwelling if they want to sell, <coughs> excuse me, their daughter a piece of land and build a house on it. Because, I don't know, you're right. Uh, renters here, homeowners here. It just doesn't seem yeah. fair in my book. Um, also, I had a question on, this will maybe come up later, also setbacks. Yeah. But zero setbacks. But I just don't see how that's physically possible. I mean, you have to have room for maintenance to work on a home or to get um, to get a fire truck in there, to get ladders, to get a uh, man lift up to fix your roof. So if you, I know this would be rare, but if you have two commercial properties, decide to build right on the property line, how can you do that? And I think that you need 
at least 10 feet separation between two residentials for fire safety. That's what I was told. So those are the concerns I had about that. I have some more from it, but I'll come back up with this. Any comment about the single family building? Uh, sure. Billy Bigor. Um, so one of the things, if you read the literature, I understand the debate. What we're trying to do, as Dana said, was we're trying to make more housing and more affordable housing. And we shouldn't assume that multifamily dwellings or two families or duplexes are not housing. They are housing. And they're more affordable housing. That's what we're trying to do. And if you look at the statistics and the studies, what they show is that when you actually allow single family housing, you wind up having less affordable housing, less workforce housing less housing overall. The studies show when larger cities, I don't have any comparison with a town of our size, but when you look at, at cities that have actually prohibited single family dwellings, what you've done is incentivize the building community to build, and, and by the way, it's not just single family, we're not just focusing on that. It's higher uh, heights, larger, uh, smaller setbacks, sorry Dave, um, and things like that that give enough of an economic boom to put multiple dwellings. Those dwellings, we don't have it here, but could be a condominium structure. Condominium structure means every one of your kids, every one of your grandkids, you can own something smaller. The seniors that have houses that are now that can be developed and expanded, their housing values actually can go up. They can expand and put an ADU in. The ADU can give them rent. They can stay in their houses. Or they can sell it and move to something smaller in apartments so they can stay here. So the statistics, the overall arching goal, says that this is more likely to help the town and solve a huge problem where we have an aging population that needs more services, fewer and fewer middle-aged people in this town staying here. And if we don't do something, we're going to actually regret it. We're just going to get older and uh, more senile. <laughs> Billy, uh, before you get that far, um, uh, <laughs> do you have any uh, thing to address Dave's concern about the zero setbacks? Or well, the zero setbacks off the top of my head are only in the downtown, right? Basically, stoplight yeah. and stoplight, right? You're in mixed use also. Uh, the setbacks are in mixed use. You can take. You can take. And uh, we have some of that now. No, no, no mixed use is four and eight. Yeah. You just yeah. change that. Four, four, right. four, no, four, 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 no, we 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 delayed the, we deli deliberated over this issue. You're absolutely spot on because to your point, like someone at the, our that the public hearing came in and said that the snow slides off the roof of their house on the, on it slides off of the roof of the neighbor's house into their parking lot, right? I don't blame them. No, I know we have that now. Snow Street right. is not what I'm thinking of. That's there. That's done. That's right. the way a lot of small towns did. Right. But you're I'm talking about new construction. In the downtown. Yeah. Like, for example, 51. Yeah. I mean, that's going to go so, so close to the other building. I don't know how you're going to get stuff in there to work on. You can't hitch the two buildings together. Well, they have a provision in the uh, design review overlay district right. that requires a plan so that you can get access to utilities, snow removal, and water removal. So rather than create a rule when you do your design, you're going to have to come to the DRB and say, I or, or the zoning in, administrator. In the downtown, you'll okay. go through design review right. overlay. And the overlay criteria is where you're addressing those specific conditions. So those specific situations. Okay, but that's... And we're, so we're giving it to you. Well, in sense, <laughs> it just has to be on a case-by-case -case basis, right. and there's no set, no set standard there. No, they have to allow, I mean, if, if when the applicant, the thinking is, okay, the thinking is, that when an applicant comes to, to the DRB and says, we want to build this building up to here, they're going to have to justify, explain, or, or document how are they meeting trash removal? Is it sure, under the I mean, property? That's usual is it snow? You know, how are you going to service? In fact, Kathy Grace is the one that pointed out, how do you get the uh, propane delivery man to deliver the sure. propane if it's around? So it has to be addressed in the design review overlay. Okay. Criteria. Is that only for the downtown area? 
Very much. That's true. The doubt, that's where the overlay design draw design of view overlay district applies. But mixed use also yes. used at zero, and now it has yes. four. It's four. Never. And just so you know, I believe Robert. We heard you. We made so ten. Eight ten tanks have to be ten, ten feet, feet though, <laughs> <laughs> from a broad border, it's not just, four feet. <laughs> so I can only imagine that somebody yeah. could put a three-story building four feet off my property line on Battle History. And there's nothing I can do about it. Is that what I'm hearing? No. Well, I didn't hear the first part of your question, but I live on Backfielder Street. Right. My understanding is now reading through these uh, 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 rules that you're coming up with zoning plans, somebody can build a three-story building four feet off my property. If it goes through design, it goes through design review, and, and the DRV approves it. According to these setbacks. If it goes through design review, it is approved by the DRV. What's to stop the DRV from approving them? Because they're going to apply the design review overlay district criteria. More bureaucracy. More bureaucracy. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. Amy Anderson, I'm on Main Street, Cross Street, pretty much. Um, my family's lived in Waterbury for, I don't know, five generations. Um, I've lived in Waterbury for 25 years in the same house. Um, I, I hear what the goals are, I do, and I believe in that. Um, I have a multifamily house. Um, sometimes we create a multifamily house because we can't afford it any other way. That doesn't mean that's actually what we'd like to have. Um, and we bought our house. You didn't buy our house. If you want to change what happens to our house, then buy our house. But I bought my house, and so I get the flexibility about how to use it from here on out, is my opinion. Um, I do think there are ways to meet both of those things. I think that it's grossly insensitive to say, um, this is going to have an impact on a few, but we're still going to do it for the many. And I, I get the rationale for that. But it is an impact on the few. And so to not acknowledge that is, is, is not OK. And I don't know why we can't say for those who currently live in their house and their heirs to follow. And then if something happens and somebody sells it outside the family that have lived there for 45 years, then sure, go ahead and do that. But you are gaining housing by getting another house put on the back of that property that took 45 years for people to have enough money to do. That family's going to have to go live somewhere else. Um, and I, I just, and so Diane's going to stay in her house until she dies. I mean, we're going to wait another how many, 40 years, you know, before it's available? I mean, that seems preposterous. And my land will be empty back there. Right, empty. She's not going <laughs> to fill it. Um, but, you know, I just think, think of the long term. Um, we bought our house as, a, as our asset. And you're you're impacting our asset, our, you know. And think of like the bakery across the street from me. They have bought it. It was a single family house, right? Tiny, like 0.5 of an acre, probably, or you know, 0.05 of an acre. Sorry, it's like really small. It's, they cannot make that into a multi-family, except for right now they have probably a tiny apartment upstairs and a business. Not everybody who buys that house is going to want to put a business and live in a tiny one-room apartment upstairs. In order for that person, if they decide to close their business, to make any money off the, the building, it would have to revert back to single family. Um, so you're taking revenue upon sale if, if some people decide to sell. And you're also taking away the flexibility that people have invested, invested in their property for that choice to do with it what we want. Usually, it's you know whatever's inside your house, if it doesn't impact everybody, is fine. I am so happy that you are changing the regulations so that we don't have to go through you know, everything that we've had to in the past to add housing. I have a pretty big law. I probably could add another unit if I wanted to or two. Um, I love that. But to give people, take away flexibility on what's inside their house. And it, it just seems preposterous that you, know, you could lose that business in a fire. And the insurance company is going to say you have to replace two kitchens. You know, I mean, I don't know. It just seems like I just want you to think through personal impact, and it should have value. Um, 
I think you can do both. And I think that by the, th the changes that you've made, I think we are going to make, I think we are going to make improved housing additions over time anyways. And I think that if we just do that provision to be caring to the people who have invested generations in this community, that's the right thing to do. Thank you. All right. That's the amount of time we've allotted for uh, comments uh, in this hearing. Um, if, uh, I'll take one more comment if anyone has one. Mary Cohen, um, I do want to speak to this prohibition or not permitting single family dwellings and particularly in the mixed use because that is my neighborhood. It has been my home for 16 years. I know that pales in comparison to many other people here, but to me it's very important. And both North and South Main Street are gateways to our town, supporting both commercial and residential uses. I do not believe, well, these, do, these draft bylaws do remove existing zoning barriers to housing development, and that is a real plus. What is not a positive step, in my view, is singling out one type of housing for burdensome restrictions. In a housing crisis, we need all types of housing. This was reinforced by housing experts at the Vermont Public Forum last week. And single family homes, according to the VHFA um, had, uh, director, are actually selling for less than condos now. There are so many condos being built. When you talk, Billy brought up people aging. A lot of the multifamily housing, certainly the new ones that are on South Main Street have, they don't work for somebody like me. If I wanted to sell my house and live in a smaller space, that doesn't do it. So I think we do need a mixture of uses in our mixed use. We need, a, in downtown, we need a mixture of incomes. So by restricting and not permitting one particular type of housing, you're going to create all kinds of problems. There's a cover article in seven days, this latest issue that speaks to that issue. When Minuski tried to increase multi-housing and there's all kinds of ripple effects that are drastically changing their, their city. We need fair and equitable public policy that will reinforce both a mix of uses as well as a mix of incomes. We need public policy that will enhance our assets, which include, in no small measure, the architectural heritage of single family dwellings built over the last two centuries. We need flexibility in our housing policies that does not unnecessarily burden homeowners on small lots or homeowners with a large family. And I would like to say the qualifying language on page 10 that Tom read, in my mind, is problematic. It's inequitable. It's confusing. It's cumbersome. And it opens, it is open to inconsistent future interpretation. Um, the public, I mean, and this seems like even if this were a policy that could be justified, and I think the real life the realities of people's real life experiences and future hopes is way far more critical than a study from somewhere else in another community in the country. But there's no public record of whether my house is a single family or a duplex. And the listing, the listing cards say, and the um, listers, uh, I'm not thinking of the word I want. Mm -hmm. um, talks about a dwelling. It doesn't say a single family dwelling, it doesn't say a duplex dwelling, or a three person, or a four person. And I was reading some of the land use um, statutes today, rereading, and they talk a lot about how, about making sure that we allow three and four family units if other type of housing is allowed. It talks about how you, you, know, you can't um, prohibit mobile home parks. You can't, all kinds of things that Vermont land use policy really is about creating housing and we are doing an incredible job 
in making sure that our zoning regulations do not prohibit or, in, or deter certain types of development. And this just throws it all into confusion and inequities. And I really wish, I don't know if it falls in the uh, technical category or it's another, has to go back to the Planning Commission, but that one provision I don't believe was well thought out and uh, it's very problematic as you've heard here. Thank you. Mary, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Roger, this is the only session we can comment? No, 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 there's going to be another session next week. Okay. And we can, we're glad to take your comments. Uh, uh, we can be sent in to the uh, municipal office. Uh, this next, uh, the next week is. Okay. Yeah. Hey, if folks are able to be briefed for a minute or so, it would be useful if there's any concerns beyond those that have been raised here tonight <coughs> to have those for our knowledge. Okay. So I think we, if there's anyone who hasn't had a chance to speak yet who has a substantive issue around a topic that hasn't been discussed, um, I would appreciate hearing that briefly before we move on. I have a question for the Planning Commission and you guys. How did they decide that it was just mixed use in downtown that couldn't turn duplexes back into single? How, what makes those other homes different than our neighborhood homes? I, I, I would like that answered. I can't answer it because I'm not on the planning commission. <laughs> um, well, for the anyone... next meeting, if we could have that information, <laughs> it would be great because it seems to me there's a legal issue there when you tell some townspeople they can do one thing and other townspeople they can't. All right. Have we got it? Let's for now, uh, let's move on. I, I noticed that I skipped over a, uh, one of the um, agenda items that was added, the resolution of sympathy. Do you want to address that now? Sure, yeah. Um, apt in that we just had a planning hearing, and I'm going to try really hard not to cry. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge the passing of Steve Blotspeak, who was the um, community planner in the town and village for over 30 years. And um, this is modeled off the resolution that was done for Lefty. And just recognizing this is the time we all uh, aboard our meeting prior to the service, I thought it would be nice um, for us to approve a commemorative resolution um, acknowledging his ongoing work in the community um, in particular, um, in addition to his work as a staff planner um, his work on community projects, um, tree and flower plantings, um, volunteering for Revitalizing Waterbury, the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, and Vermont Planners Association. Um, he received a number of awards. Um, so I think if the board is comfortable with it, we can just approve this and Karen offered to print it on nice leather head and provide it to the family. Okay. You, like you can, I don't feel the need to. <laughs> Well, uh, in memory of uh, Steve speech for the Resolution of Sympathy. Whereas the community of Waterbury was deeply saddened by the death of Stephen Steve Lott's speech on Wednesday, April 24, 2024. And whereas Steve lived with his family in Waterbury for numerous years and served as the community planner for the town and village of Waterbury for over 10, for over 30 years. Whereas, in his role as planner, Steve interacted with countless Waterbury residents, volunteers, and staff, and supported a wealth of community projects from comprehensive plans to tree and flower plantings. Whereas, in addition to his role as planner, Steve was an avid volunteer for a host of community, state, and regional organizations, including Revitalizing Waterbury, the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, Vermont Planners Association, and many more. Whereas Steve's many contributions to the town of Waterbury and the state of Vermont were recognized with a variety of awards, including the Vermont Planner Association's Pro Professional Planner of the Year Award and Revitalizing Waterbury Volunteer of the Year and Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Hamilton Award. Whereas beyond his official capacity, Steve was known for sharing his musical talents, volunteer time, and can-do attitude at a wealth of community events. Whereas his passing is sorely felt, 
leaving a big hole in the heart of his family, his friends, his neighbors, and the entire community of Waterbury. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Town of Waterbury Select Board that we hereby express our sincere sympathy to his family, his wife Judith, children, uh, Colina, Yana, and uh, Anchi, Anchi, uh, granddaughter Hunter, sister Sylvia Lot Speech Green, and brother and sister in law uh, Charlie Lot Speech and Phyllis Wolf. Be it further resolved that <coughs> this resolution be spread upon the permanent records of the town of Waterbury and copy of this resolution be presented to his family as a token of our sympathy on his passing and share our respect and appreciation for Steve's numerous contributions to the town of Waterbury. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dated the 6th of May, 2024, at Waterbury, Vermont. Motion. I say I'll move to approve the resolution of sympathy. Been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. <coughs> Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Thanks to Steve. All right. Um, now we are going to move on to the um, the entertainment permit. More planning. Uh, no, we amended the agenda for this to be. Oh, yeah, you're right. Craft fair, sorry. Yeah, craft fair. Craft fair. No, that we're was going to the craft fair first, yeah. and yeah. then we're going to do the Walker Second designation, and then we'll be back okay. on track. Okay. I have that back. Okay. Uh, so we just received some new information from our applicants. For Welcome Catholic. back. You're watching the finest of water right <laughs> <meetings. laughs> We'd really fill your bingo board. Um, um, do we have that info? Oh, sorry. I think you're Oh, yes. I would love some added info. Is that Katarina's back? Sure. What are you passing around? Yes. Less colored on and to walk around the event as well as Angela and uh, myself to make sure things go smoothly and nothing. Yellow vests for them to wear so they can be well seen. We'll, we're planning on putting our logo on the back from our business, our business logo so they can see that. It's, if you look for if you need any information. And then also I sent an email out because our food trucks all need to have their own permits and I sent an email so they're supposed to be doing that this week too. So. And how many food trucks are you um, Well, there was six, but now five because one is out of business, so he's not coming anymore. <laughs> but so there's going to be at least five, five of them there. So okay. all the volunteers have fluorescent kind Yep, we just bought vests. We have them in the car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's got a bright yellow. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. All right. Any other questions for them? Oh, um, there's a new map also. Okay. I would like to point out that this is their third time coming back, and in my short time on the select board, I, I've never had to talk about a permit like this three times, three meetings in a row. So I appreciate your patience, and it seems that you've answered most of the questions that we've had, and. 
keeping, keeping up your spirits and coming back to meetings. I think Katarina has raised her hand. Oh. Katarina Melissa is recreation director. I'd also just like to mention that they have spent time outside of these meetings meeting with me. I included that in the memo that I shared with you all. They spent an enormous amount of their personal time just preparing for these permits, and the craft fair hasn't even happened yet. Do you want to make a motion? Good. Any other concerns or questions? And if not, do I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the craft fair permit for the day of, or the days of June 29th and 30th. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. <laughs> Any uh, extensions? No. Okay. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. Hope now you guys we're going to go to the Waterbury Center Village designation. No. Okay. Uh, Tom, can you provide a little clarification on this, please? Sure. There's an extension. There's a large packet. There's a lot of background. But the map is on the next to last page. Um, it's an eight, the, the village center needs to be renewed every eight years, and the benefits of a village, of a village center are almost identical to the benefits of being in a designated downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, there's tax credits that are available to the uh, businesses there that would otherwise not be available. There's also benefits to the town and the EFA because work that we do in and proximate the village center um, gets some favorable rating on grant applications. So there was an EFA grant to extend a water line uh, near the village center. Uh, the village center is already served with water, but to extend a water line, but because it was near the village center, I think that helped. I think it also helped. Um, we received a grant for Hope Davy to do some work in Accessible Pass, mm -hmm. which is partially within the village center. Um, Right. And I think that also helped. Um, so it's one of those it's one of those checklist items, but there's tangible benefits to the property owners in the village centers, tangible benefits to the town. And uh, according to this map, the village constitutes everything from where Guptill and Maple Street meet out to the seminary and uh, the uh, pavilion at Hope Davy. Otherwise known to us who live on it as the triangle. Yeah. Yes, the triangle <laughs> plus, uh, <laughs> plus uh, an extension uh, uh, around it. And the seminary, the Waterbury Park. Yes, the, the seminary park could be important. Um, now the, the field behind the seminary is partially in the village center. It's essentially an abandoned baseball field. We brush hog it now once or twice a year, but mm -hmm. with the flooding we've had, there's, there's an increased Think desire to think about that field differently, and maybe we move some fields from the floodplain up to seminary. Mm -hmm. So that may help us if we decide to seek some funding to do that. Okay. Katie, did you want to tell us why you were so excited about this? Um, I am a property owner in the Waterbury Center Village Center, and I have been involved in this that Tom highlighted and as we think about to this point areas for um, further development that is outside of a flood hazard area and as a center that is a few miles outside of the village I think it's um, an area that is ripe with opportunity for both residential uses but also commercial recreation. There's, um, I think, a lot of really exciting things. There's already exciting things happening with the park. Um, and so I, I think it's very wise of the town to continue this village designation. Yeah, Martha. Timely. It's also timely. Uh -huh. We're starting to go in, into dates, right. too. So I don't know if I was mentioning, but OK. okay. Any comments? Yes, Mike. 
Um, the field that you were talking about, is that the, the field behind the seminary building? Yes. Okay, just wanted to make sure I had the right question. Any more questions, comments? Yes, Alyssa. It's also a really good answer to why are you only focusing on the downtown to say that, oh, we're also thinking about why we're saying uh, Yeah, see, we, we love all parts of our town. <laughs> okay. Do I have a motion? No. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I would make a motion to renew the Village Center designation for Waterbury Center. Village Center. <laughs> 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 Otherwise known as the triangle. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The center is redesignated. All right. All right, uh, next we have the uh, concerned uh, appointment of Joshua Lincoln to the Conservation Commission. And well, let's start with that one and then we'll uh, move on to Joe uh, Wurzbacher for the DRB. Uh, is Joshua Lincoln here? I only met Joshua once and I I don't honestly remember what he looked like, but I don't think he's here. All right. Um, I can tell you, I spoke. We have his application, oh, but go ahead. Okay. I, there was a member of. And, and Amy's here, here if you have any questions. It was um, Marcy Blavel. Um. Amy, do you have any? Uh, uh, yeah, th sorry, there's a little bit of a about break. the uh, nomination of Joshua Lincoln. No. Um, the only comments I would say is he's been attending se um, the last several monthly sessions and has been very active and engaged. He's been very diligent, and um, he's really taken his time to deliberate not only his ability to commit his time but also to make sure that it was a right fit so i i personally think that um he's been probably one of the most thorough candidates i've seen um as it comes to joining the commission and we'd welcome him happily he was a recommendation from marty actually um and his background seems to be well-rounded with um not only his professional background as a veterinary but as in his personal experience he has nature based um, interest and he does quite a bit of um, personal uh, phot photography and things of that nature. Um, so again, I highly recommend him. Great, thank you. Any other comments about uh, this nomination? Do I have a motion? I Alyssa, sorry. I didn't oh, you didn't have a hand up? Okay, uh, Mike. I have a motion to approve Joshua Lincoln for a term on the Waterbury Conservation Second that. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, do we have to, uh, is the term already set? Yeah, I would like the term to say, well, you have to choose. There's several vacancies. So we have one ending 2025, we have one ending 2026, and we have one ending 2028. Is it not being there, it's hard to say. Yeah. Well, do you want to give the smallest one or the next one? Let's go along. I think that's can't give it yeah. the longest one. I would say give it the longest one yeah. so you don't have to re redo it. <laughs> And he could always resign. Okay. Yeah, so I'll add the amendment that it's the, the longest term, 128. Okay. Mike, do you accept the friendly amendment? That's a very friendly amendment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. The motion is to approve uh, Joshua Lincoln uh, for a, a tenure end in, ending in 2028. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, congratulations to Joshua Lincoln. Next we have a, uh, considering the appointment of Joe Wurzenbacher to the DRB. Uh, Joe's already been serving. So the renewal of uh, his tenure. He also serves on the National Executive Affairs Committee. Okay. Of our 
Yeah. All right, and just for clarification, this is a term ending. Okay, this is for alternate ending in 2027. Do I have a motion? I move to appoint uh, Joe Wurzenbacher for which, what was the second term? Uh, uh, term ending in 2027. Term ending in 2027 to the Waterbury Conservation Committee. No, no, no. 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 The DRB. DRB, sorry. Uh, I have a conservation <laughs> commission. Okay. Uh, as, as all alternate, right? You should know that no Joe on it. Do you need to restate it or is it pretty much open? It's good. Okay. <laughs> I'll second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Congratulations to Joe. All right. We are now moving forward uh, to the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir Wake Sports. Uh, Eric Chinden. Yeah. Please do. Seat of honor. <laughs> Just so I like an empty house. I'm not an entertainer, but. <laughs> Except Mike. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't know what more I can say. I've kind of been pretty open with my stuff with you, and I'd probably like to ask you if you have any questions, anything in particular that you'd like to. Well, um, the, uh, you're requesting us to uh, support your uh, petition. Yes, and no. for, uh, for wake sports to be uh, prohibited from uh, the reservoir. Yes. Is that correct? It's, uh, that, and that's, that's actually one thing I should bring up to those of you who are reading this. It's, uh, <clears throat> this has dominate, dominated my life here for months. So it's uh, but the, the very first sentence in this whole thing it's right here, and it, and it says, so the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir or petitioner hereby petitions the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, DEC, a department within the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources to exercise its rulemaking authority in accordance with 10 VSA 1424E to prohibit wake sports on the Waterbury Reservoir. So that's the only thing, to prohibit wake sports in the Waterbury Reservoir. And uh, uh, I mention that because every every other sentence, li literally, and the whole rest of this thing uh, backs that up. And what we've used for uh, our points to address are all of this, the things that the uh, Department of Environmental Conversation and, and Conversation Conservation and uh, and the uh, ANR Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, they have to go by these. These have been rules that have been adopted adopted over the years. I've had a few comments, and even Mike had some concerns about uh, you know us trying to shut down some. Uh, of the, the stuff. It isn't the case. In fact, if we were to bring up at, at the hearing uh, anything at, but those five or six words there, they would shut it down completely right there on the spot. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, in fact, I have to tell, and we've had it at, at other uh, presentations, I've had people concerned about uh, losing their motorboat rights. And there might be some people who would like that, but the reality is it's uh, it's set in concrete. It's, it's not, it's, it would be an act of Congress to get rid of motorboats on the Waterbury Reservoir. Mm -hmm. That's because of all the past laws. So it's now a matter of preserving uh, to the best of their ability. And they right in here, they actually define the, the layout of the reservoir and what it is. It has no houses. It's a part of the state forest, the largest state forest in the state. And it a, has a, 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 how can you say, a wilderness quality to it. And that's the word that they use over and over again. Right. And so they're trying to, uh, the state would like to preserve that as much as possible. And they need support like ours to make that happen. So uh, mm -hmm. if you have any other questions, I could address them. All right. Uh, I saw Alyssa first. 
I'm sorry, can you just differentiate between wake sports and wake votes? Okay, I deeply good. understand the concern with wake votes. Do you need to say wake sports because well, of legalese? You bring up a, a, a pretty touchy point with the, in this whole conversation because uh, when this was, uh, we gave, those, those of us who gave testimony, it was uh, February 15th, um, and that's the, the day that uh, seven out of the eight uh, LCA, our, the, the, the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules, uh, voted seven to one. And at that point, they went into a huddle uh, up there. And, and, uh, and what happened was a lot of people who had wake votes were concerned that they have this, I don't know if you realize, the cheapest one you can get is about $175,000. The new ones that are out there are over 600000 So, you know, by default, I'll just throw this in the, here while I'm talking, but it's, a, it's going to be a very small number of people who can dominate a huge body of water. One of these boats on the Waterbury Reservoir could change anybody's life out there. So the the concerns of the those who owned wakeboards said the boats said okay we can't do the water the wake sports uh, out here uh, what am I going to do with my boat I can't I, I can't use it on this lake because there are a lot of lakes like uh, all over the state and, and where these well, this was being these uh, sports were being you know used or not, well, they were doing them. And uh, so the state got, in the, and then it got into this, uh, it, somebody said, if I can't use my wake boat, I'm gonna sue the state. And that changed the discussion. So a and is short-staffed, DEC, it's a, it's, it's a really tough situation there right now. The, uh, the, the, the money isn't there to do a lot of stuff, and so they capitulated to that, because you know, what they, said is that you cannot use, uh, you can bring a wake boat on a lake, and use it as a fishing boat or whatever, if it's not in wake sport mode. Here are the three big things about wake sport mode. One, it has a V-shaped uh, uh, hull. hull. Now, un unlike water ski boats, they're with flat hull pretty much. The uh, the ballast tanks, the, the, the only boat that has ballast tanks. And we can't, and running that the greeter program that we run, it's impossible for us to peek into those tanks. So we've had eight years, we, we had we have little Nyad in there that came in about 11 years ago. And since we've had this program, we have not had any introduction of new invasives in the Waterbury Reservoir, whereas many of the lakes around us are, have gotten them. Right. So that's a, a testimony to what we have. And that was in spite of the fact that the Waterbury Reservoir is the most used lake it's the, um, and, and most used campground, uh, ex except for Sandbar. Mm -hmm. It's one of the biggest income producers in the state, and in this region, it is the biggest producer, and it's the big for the state. And then also, uh, when we talk about revenue, you know, I know Eric, just to be clear, I totally hear you on why the boat. So just, just, just <laughs> let me put my cards on the table and, and be a little more yeah, direct. So, so. I understand why the wake boats boats are damaging and concerning. And personally, I fully support doing what we can to prohibit them. I understand, I'll just state for the record, we've received a memo from Waterbury's Conservation Commission highlighting the same points about invasives, value, I totally hear you. I will confess in a different state, not Vermont, called Maine, I know humans put a wakeboard on their feet behind a ski boat, which I understand doesn't have this V-shaped hull. So I'm just curious about the language of, I would love to ban wake boats. Do we need to say wake sports? That's a wake, they're, they're only looking at the wake sports, and that's why, I, I don't know if I put lake, wake boats in there or not, but if, if they can't, uh, they can't deny wake boats. They say they have to let allow it. And water skiing is not considered a wake sport? Uh, being on a wake boat is not a wake sport. No, it's only when you have somebody behind you. I know, water skiing. And well, water skiing, but what the big thing is uh, that these boats create a wake large enough and powerful enough that uh, uh, surfers can surf without holding onto a rope. Well, so maybe I, maybe I yeah. can help you put it in real common language. 
there are people who run these small little wake <coughs> ski boards and they run them on, on ropes, and they run them with very little wake. Yeah. These wake boats are basically designed to, they have to go in the water, but you can't, they're so heavy, they basically draw in water, and then they- I agree with the boats. They create a big six foot wave, and then when they leave, they have to empty it out. Right, my only question is just on, I'm noting that we're saying water skiing is okay. And in right. my head, water skiing is a wake sport. So I'm just trying to understand well, how you distinguish it. Water Maybe skiing I can is, a, is a water sport. Yeah, yeah. The, water. yeah it's, a, it's a water sport. The okay. difference is that uh, <laughs> the, the wake that's created by these boats, when they're filled with water, going extremely <laughs> slow, yeah, they create a big enough wake. I totally understand why it's a problem. I'm just trying to make sure the water skiers can Ski, respectfully. Yeah, no, <laughs> As someone who grew up water skiing, it was, and it doesn't have these problems. No, I don't think there. That, that's not what's being considered here. Well, if we do, if we get into, go ahead. No. Okay. First, in full disclosure, I am on the board of, uh, as most people know, the Friends of the Waterbird Reservoir. I do, in principle, agree with a lot. One, I was, I know they floated. They wanted to be us a petitioner, which I didn't think. I think we should only be. A letter of support because we yeah. we don't own the reservoir. The Department of Forest Parks and Recreation own the reservoir, so I don't think we can be a, a petitioner where the Friends of the Waterbury Reservoir. It's something I, we draw. I think can be. My biggest concern, where I, I always hate to take away people's sports and stuff if they do it in a sound way, but I have kind of been mellowed out in terms of that position because I do think. <laughs> There are issues, and there are going to be bad actors. And there's very little parts of the reservoir where these, even under the existing regulations, that they'll be able to be used. Basically, the dam section. And as as Eric's put in his um, manifest, that you know it's going to endanger a lot of people, which I do agree. I think the biggest harm, and I think where, the, where we stand, and I think the Conservation Commission gets that is the thing about the ballast, of what invasives can, you know, in that ballast in their tanks, they could be uh, on Lake Champlain, and they may have taken out some of the ballast, but some of the, you know, you know, the vegetation stuff may still remain. And as I think Eric pointed out, you're not gonna be able to, the people who were, you know, doing the greeter program, they're not gonna be able to look into those, those ballast tanks. So for us to really have a very small area, I, I think we can't, uh, as much as I wasn't so much in support before, I think I can be in support now. Well, thank you, Mike. And, and, uh, but I want to mention too, in the arm where it is at the dam, uh, every single uh, person, boat, whatever, paddleboarder who launches from the dam is going to have to, I call it the gauntlet, gauntlet A and below it, gauntlet B, and then on the end, gauntlet C. And it fits the definition of a gauntlet perfectly, but it's going to be, uh, it's, it's going to be tough. And here's what very much well could happen. The word is out. If, if people are calling in right now, and Steve at Umiak is, is feeling the pinch, and he's losing, people are not coming that have come for years are going to a different lake. And the, uh, uh, Steve, <clears throat> Steve has been concerned about the, the, uh, the, the revenue from it, I think I mentioned to you, is 10 to $25 million, well, from 10 to million 10 years ago to about $25 million. Yes? No, oh, I was just going to say, I, I feel like I don't need any more explanation. I okay. understand what you're saying perfectly. I just need, I have a clarification question about sure. We are being asked to, as a select board, express our support for Friends of Waterbury Reservoir's petition to the Agency of Natural Resources. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Correct. And can I just? So, uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, if accepted, the um, 
and I will schedule a hearing. Probably not going to happen until after this next season, uh, and then they'll make a determination. Gotcha. Probably for the following season. Okay. Yeah. So let's. And I'm just confirming you had it in your memo, but I have a memo from you, Eric, dated 5/4/24, and it just says our petition will not impact any established normal uses of the reservoir, including water skiing, fishing, paddle sports, sailing, or adaptive water sports. That's yeah. correct. Great. I'm good. Yes. And so, in the, that, uh, the reason I was kind of talking about this with the question questions you're asking because there are a lot of unique questions to, uh, about this sport right. and so and I have read I can't tell you how much I've read out there in the different lakes throughout the country not one of the lakes is the same as it was when these book wake sports came and when the first one first one or two come every other user literally every other user leaves the lake that's how much of a, of a danger they are and now there's a lake called Lake Rassoon in Georgia, same size, 834 uh, acres, or worth of 839, and the they have 177, 127 wake boats on it now, and it's uh, it's it, 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 nobody else could do anything. So, but anyway, that's the, you know. Um, and I also want to. Uh Thank the uh, Conservation Commission uh, for the research that they did on this and the recommendations that they made, uh, citing in particular uh, concerns about erosion uh, due to the waves, the uh, introduction of invasive species, as a number of people have mentioned, and safety concerns uh, due to the height of the waves. Um, I'll pass this around, by the way. This is a little, uh, little uh, cut. Yeah, of we saw, I think we saw that. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the, the two I sets. I shot to you before. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. I'll do take it. that off your hands. I'll take that off your There you go. Do we have a motion? <laughs> I move that the select board support the petition to ban the sports from the water area reservoir by the Friends of Water Bay Reservoir to the agency national I'll second. Okay. Moved and seconded for the discussion. Mike. This is a technicality. Should I abstain because I'm on the board of the the board of the uh, it's your choice. I don't know that it's a particular uh, conflict of interest. Personally profit. Yeah. I'm not profit. I was probably more than a detractor for a while. So I'm now I've now turned my cheek. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? I'm abstaining because I have uh, personally wakeboarded uh, uh, on the reservoir and enjoy it, but uh, I understand your concerns. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> and by the way, Francine is down at the Duxbury meeting tonight. They changed it because of Memorial Day. Huh? So uh, she's down there doing that. And, All right. And, uh, thank double, you. And when do you need your down. letter of support by? It would be the sooner the better. We want to uh, put the petition in sometime within See a week. That? So if we, if we could do that, that would be great. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great follow-up. Hold it up as a conservation The two monsters stacked on top of All right. <laughs> So that's the, the that's the weight of that's that's how much balance is in there. The weight of two Honda Civics or two Ford Fiestas. So I, I did a little photoshopping. <laughs> All right, send me a copy of that. Absolutely. Uh, All right. <laughs> um, Noting we're only five minutes behind, somewhat surprisingly. Um, we now are considering uh, the buyout uh, in place of the good fire. Oh, I'm the only one that has that paperwork because okay. all we have is the original. Mm -hmm. um, so it's right here, Roger. There's, sorry about that. Um, right. Is it, what's customary? Do you read it? Do you just ask questions of Tom? All right, Tom. Uh, Tom will explain it to us. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it not stable? It is not stable. Oh. It right. is signed we... and notarized if you're going to allow it. Why don't we? Uh, I know. I'm take sorry. your word for that. You've got all the proper documentation and uh, not disturb it. Does. 
fourth ballot request. Uh, the town has the first one is 35 North Main, and there's um, two properties in Union Street um, right next to this one that are seeking buyouts. Um, this is Terry Gates and Peggy Gates. Um, they've been they bought the house. Um, they've been in there quite some time, and. I discussed a buyout with them or an elevation project with them immediately after the flood, um, and they weren't interested, but I think they've reached a point where they've, they've now changed their tune. And what I've said to people who are interested in the buyout is there's no obligation on their part until they sign the purchase and sale agreement. Um, so there's, there's no harm in applying for a buyout. It's going to be probably nine months until there's a number back from the federal government at which point they can accept or reject the number. But it's, um, you know, at this point, if it's approved by the board, it's from their perspective, it's essentially hurry up and wait. Mm -hmm. um, and again, no harm, no foul, they can withdraw. And so what I've said to people is if you're interested, typically there's a there's a town share of 25% of the buyout amount. And as of right now, the state is covering that portion. So there's no cost to the town. There's a minor hit on the grand list, um, but no cash cost to the town. Um, and from their perspective, I've said this is also a way to potentially sell your home without paying a realtor fee. So in some respects, it could be a good number, and you could have zero, you know, almost zero closing costs. Um, so they're now at the point where they want to consider the buyout. I think from our perspective, um, if the three buyouts on Union are approved, there's just one house at the very bottom. He's now interested in an elevation project. Mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty good outcome if that would all happen. Yeah. Okay. Do I have a motion? Um, move to approve the buyout request for 38 Union Street and authorize the necessary paperwork. Second. Move and second it. Any further discussion? I just have a comment. Sure. Um, I was surprised uh, for this particular request. Um, but I do believe that that section of Un Lower Union Street, as our climate worsens, will continue to flood over and over and over again. So this is a good idea. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all of them say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. And the uh, request is approved. And there is a signature page in there that Karen has. Yeah, I don't know if you want to do that tonight. I can go get my stamps or somebody. I can, um, can we just quickly we see may have uh, yeah. a further session after the next agenda item. So we can all take turns. <coughs> oh, sorry. I think there's only, oh, here it is. So there's only space for two grantees and a witness. So I need at least two of you to sign it, and Tom can witness it. So, do you want to do that now? I think in the past we just had them all sign someone. Oh, okay. Well, she knock yourselves out. I have that much room to fit all your names. <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll make mine really small. Yes, yeah, I will and make yours really, really small, small too. We should have three. We'll have the unanimous support of the minute, but three signatures on the page. That so at least it's a quorum. It's a quorum. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> I'll, I'll notarize it. I'll figure out how to make it work. To and uh, oh, that's the date is over. Yeah, the side. I do anything below. Um, right below my name. Know, state of Vermont, County of. Okay. Um, next meeting agenda. Mm -hmm. Do we have anything to take a look at? Yeah, it should be in your packet. Okay. Right, down towards the bottom here. Boop, ba there was many, yeah, I think I see it. More than a couple calls this week from individuals who thought that rental property ordinance was going to be discussed tonight. So, yeah, we yeah, still definitely have to have it on there. Um, conversation about that going on. Okay, um, as you can see, what's on there uh, for next week is uh, the hazard mitigation plan public hearing. Uh, there was already one. That will need to be delayed. There was one public hearing. There was some good input, and we're going to work one more with our consultant to oh. incorporate some of that. So All right. That's so that's cool. off. And when so that goes that to June. Uh, sorry. And was that public hearing? That was um, last week. Didn't have to be before the select board. Okay. 
It was on the. It was on the second at six o'clock. Sorry, watch the so much. It required and got out. Um, and then uh, we did say that we would also continue the hearing of the uh, new bylaws. Oh, it's going to be a fun one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, they're always fun. Mm -hmm. So, and then the um, rental property ordinance. Uh, do you have uh, a would, yes choice uh, as to which goes first? Ooh. Zoning. Zoning first. Everybody happy with that? Mm -hmm. um, I would like to. Um, either amend or just include in our notes um, onto, uh, I'm just looking at it, to include or a discussion during rental property ordinance on the um, proposal for a trust, housing trust specifically, not just any trust. Um, Should that be a standalone agenda? Should it be a standalone yes. agenda? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, so that'll be after uh, rental property ordinance. Sure. Uh, and it, establishment of a housing rental housing trust. Is that what you're calling it? I think just housing trust. Yeah, housing, just trust. housing trust. Trust in the proposal. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, the long discarded uh, and rescheduled animal control ordinance. Going to do that. We're really knocking them out of the park with these ordinances. Um, <laughs> Why don't we open with animal control? I don't know. Well, let's do it. I think that would be a mistake. Uh, I think we should uh, keep it yeah. to last because we may have to continue that one, whereas the others we may be able to finish them up. Not moving that meeting, Mike. It'd be additional meeting with the uh, Board of Abatement. Thank okay. you for reminding me. Uh, oh, this yeah, is a Board of Abatement, abatement hearing as well? Yeah. So, All right. So, so that'll be at 6. So the Board of Abatement's going to be at 6 to follow with the select board meeting. That's, yeah, and I don't even know if it has to be 6. It's only 1. I feel like it's really yeah. well in with previous ones, there's a precedent that's kind of been set, so yeah. it might be 6.30. Let me talk with Liz Schlegel. Yeah, I think 6.30 is reasonable. Yeah. Okay, 6.30. We'll so. pencil it in at 6.30. I, but I will send out a separate agenda for that meeting. Um, um, I, it feels like we're getting closer and closer to uh, having to renegotiate our state police contract. And we can have that, um, we can have that at the next meeting. For the uh, 20th? Yes. State contract. All right. We want to talk about the state police contract before or after uh, animal control. I vote before. We'll mm -hmm. wrap it up on the fines. It'll look really straightforward. I'm also wondering for all of these, Roger, I'm taking a class <laughs> on facilitation because it's what I do for work. <laughs> and they have, a, there's a practice with agenda sometimes where you say like discussion colon or like second discussion, colon, or very first draft that we definitely might not adopt as written for discussion, colon. And I'm just thinking about some of the um, interactions we've had at meetings and just folks not understanding, you know, like what's in, admittedly. What are we doing? Yeah, process. what stage are we at in an ordinance right. or hearing adoption process? Right. And I'm just wondering if, um, Maybe it's a parentheses after, um, like, you know, second hearing for adoption or follow-up discussion for potential adoption or mm -hmm. first conversation on fee changes. I'm just wondering about maybe a little more specificity in helping just frame. Okay. So, for doing. example, bylaws would be second hearing for adoption? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then I guess it's just a question. I, this... Um, <coughs> Yeah, um, if we want to ask for changes, that needs to be after tonight or after that hearing. So the, the thought on bylaws, 
don't take this 100% as gospel because I've been a long day. My understanding is you need by law one public hearing. But, but the intent in the conversation was that given this has been in the works for eight years and it's some major changes, having more than one select board meeting was appropriate. And I think we learned that tonight that we didn't have enough time. Um, and then the other question we've got to answer is if the select board wants changes, um, depending on the nature of the changes, we'll get a legal opinion and then may go back to the PC. So for that, what I propose, I'm, I'm wondering kind of like with rental, should we have a second, like in, in my mind at least, the hearing is the formality, second hearing on bylaw, and then should we just add a discussion <coughs> of bylaw adoption after that, which would be the board discussing said input from tonight and that day? Sure. Or that would be my proposal for us. Discussion in public session? Yeah, so, I just feel like, or, or I, I mean, the board can say what they want. I feel like there is an element of having taken in a lot of feedback, potentially taking in more feedback and wanting yeah. to discuss it. Yeah, I uh, personally feel like uh, there may need to be a couple changes. So some, some towns, some cities are convention for things like bylaws or rental property is to put in parentheses discussion or discussion and possible vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like something possible vote. <laughs> I like that. Maybe. Unless it was a possible vote. Maybe. Like here, the public didn't really hear if you know any feedback right. on what they had to say. And you know, myself and Roger just said I have some issues with some of the stuff that I heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like there are a couple of issues that. Uh, we may want to make uh, adjustment, at least personally. Yeah. So, okay, and just so is that the intended agenda item for both bylaw and rental? Um, yeah, well, but the uh, for the rental property, uh, I believe what we've done is take out uh, a couple of the issues that uh, met with resistance. Mm -hmm. So that now we're just looking at the establishment of a registry for both long and short term rentals or any type of rental, housing rental, uh, about which I have not heard a lot of controversy. Wasn't it suggested that we change the name of the agenda item too to more closely mirror that? My it is technically an ordinance. I, mean, it's it's money. I don't think a lot of people have as much angst against a registry per se, getting some sort of data and stuff like that. I mm -hmm. think the, the more action steps as a result of fees and what you can and cannot do, I think there's a lot more angst. So I think personally that we, we need to take you know some of the data that we get from a registry and use that if we're going to go another step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess based on what I'm hearing, uh, the uh, <coughs> we could have uh, uh, taking testimony uh, uh, a second round of testimony on the rental property ordinance in preparation for a vote. Karen point should it say rental registry ordinance? Rental yeah, registry I ordinance. Think, I, yeah, okay. That would be a very good change. Okay. Because I, I'm sure all of you are getting the emails that we all get. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of angst about I think in people aren't as opposed to some sort of a registry, but as to it going further to ordinances, right. I think they're I think probably a lot about Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, Can I ask a clarifying question? Shoot. Okay. So given Alyssa's suggestion, I'm just going to read what I typed, which I would transfer to the agenda. So bylaw update public hearing, second hearing for testimony. 
is that is that the proper language for your idea? No. Okay. I mean, yeah, it seems like okay. the general idea. And then uh, discussion of public, excuse me, discussion of bylaw public hearings, rental registry ordinance third hearing for adoption. Oh, I like that. Proposal for rental housing trust first hearing. Because I don't really, I don't think we've really. I, don't think I wouldn't consider it a second. No, it was, a, it was a suggestion at yeah. last meeting. Yeah. So, we, so it's really just the first. Yeah. If, yeah. if, if mm -hmm. everyone agrees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then state police contract, it's really the first. Yeah. And do we, um, is it a rental housing trust or is it simply, well, I guess, I guess, let me step back. Um, there are established housing trusts, right. and I think to people, right. especially someone like Mike, who was in the business for a long time, that means yeah. something very specific. Do you want to call it something more broad, like a housing investment fund? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just I'm, trying. I to. mean, you can call it Steve as long as it does what I suggested it does. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Lott's speech, a memorial I, fund. Oh, yeah. Well, I, think, I think there is some angst against some of the trusts and what they potentially do. I think it all depends upon how you frame, because there are a number of organizations that and I would do, present my and I, I, I'm just one that I hate replication of services, that things you could get elsewhere. I will okay. come prepared with cliff notes from and housing trusts from around the state. state. I might try preliminary discussion. I guess I would just know the, the reason the hearings have really set, and, I, and I'll just name this brings up a useful thing, so some city councils around here have a really set first and second reading, and I will say, like, Kane even at one point was like, so how do I, like, introduce a thing? And I was like, oh, we kind of talk about it and throw it on the agenda, and maybe it's something we talk about, but just say we haven't been that formal, but I think preliminary discussion at least conveys that, like, it's the first time we're looking at it. And that's a perfect way to frame it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Karen. All right. Any other items that we want to yours. put no, on the wall for uh, the 20th? No? Over, under, on meeting length? No. Um. <laughs> what are we thinking, 11? Yeah, we're doing 20. pretty well tonight. No, next, next week. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we're probably up to uh, 9.30, I expect. Do we do we expect hazard mitigation to be quick at this hearing? He told me to take it off. Oh, sorry, I missed it. All those different reviews, I would yeah. give, give it until 10 o'clock. Probably, yeah. We'll, uh, uh, yeah we'll, we'll do the fine tuning uh, um, later this week or uh, next. Thank you. Will you be the arbiter of the agenda? It's mm -hmm. one of my great prerogatives. Um, OK, I think we're done with this item. Um, do we have need for a, uh, an executive session? I think a short one to discuss Stanley Watson. Do I have a motion? I move to find that premature public knowledge of pending real estate matters would clearly place the town of Waterbury at a substantial disadvantage. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Um, I move to enter executive session for the purposes of discussion of pending real estate transactions. Second. Lisa, all? don't expect any action to be taken. I was just, I was just gonna say. <laughs> I'm gonna ask on my way out. <laughs> Did you plan on coming back and bringing votes after this? Uh, <coughs> say when you're buying beer. <laughs> So for the Moved and seconded. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Oh, and invite the municipal manager. <clears throat> was close. Sorry. I moved Second. to enter executive session and invite the municipal manager. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay.